My mate Kenton has done some extraordinary things in his life and he's pretty hilarious as well. We're going to talk about climbing, we're going to talk about sports, hot topics, and we're going to merge all that together for an entertaining 30 minutes. Well, it's Thursday yet again. It's 1800 British summertime. That can only mean one thing. It's cool conversations once again. And really, really pumped by this week's guest. We got rid of the Welsh guy. Uh, we didn't need him anymore. So um, we called upon some real friends of mine. And what we've actually done today, we, uh, we've done a pre-record for the first time. The reason being is Melissa, who lives just outside Seattle, has a two-year-old, beautiful two-year-old daughter. And to try and fit in between time delays and lags and everything else, we did a little pre-record, and that's what we're going to show you in a bit. But you, you're going to dig this. One of the best interviews we've done so far. Melissa, she is so so eloquent in her thought processes. She's so humble. I have no doubt that you guys are going to dig our conversation. So without further ado, I think we just need to jump straight into it. And this is Cool Conversations with Melissa not Reed. Melissa, hey, listen, I'm really, uh, I'm so pleased you've come on. I know it's super early in the morning for you. Um, I hope you're pumped with coffee. I, I, I have my one here. You're from America, so come on. Let's, let's see. Oh, check that bad boy out. Is that full? Full. Full and ready. And is it black? <laughs> yeah, you, you, the Americans always it's, drink yeah, it black, don't they? Oh, oh you're so yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're so cool. You're, you're too cool for school, Melissa. So listen, um, we go back, what, how far? Eight, about eight, nine years uh, since we first met? Twelve years, yeah. 2000. Yeah, I think 12 years. Yeah, a long, long time. I've not seen you for a few years, so there's loads I want to talk about. But to, to, to kickstart it, I've I got to know, I've not seen you since then. Being a mum, just explain to me what that means to you. Yeah, it's been amazing. I mean, I think that as a mountain guide, I'm sort of like a professional uh, manager of risk and logistics and people's happiness. And I think being a parent is so much of the same thing in a way, but so much more rewarding. And my client can never leave. So that's nice. You know, she like lives in my house, and, uh, but she doesn't tip. So, you know, that's tricky. But um, yeah, it's been so rewarding. I think watching a little human grow is watching the passage of time in front of you. And we just do so few things that show us the passage of time in that way. And it's just been such an incredible gift. Wow, absolutely amazing. And, and, and you're, so I, I, as you know, I, I've got two young children, a bit older than uh, Nakaya. It's two, is that right? She had a birthday about three, four days ago. Yeah, yeah, she's just two. And what was the birthday cake? Was there a birthday cake there? Have you got any birthday cake left? Or more to the point, have you sent any across to me? It's in the mail. I don't know. <laughs> We're losing you a little bit here. Okay. Are you back again? Yeah. We're losing you. I got the gist got you, of it. Guys. You're using the excuse of a global pandemic for not getting cake to me. That's the worst excuse I've ever heard about. I'm using that excuse for a lot of things, including like I haven't brushed my hair in a solid month <laughs> and um, many, right. many other things. Okay, seeing that it's seven o'clock in the morning your time, you're looking smashing on it. So don't, I mean, if you see my hair, it looks like, I think there's blackbirds in my hair at the moment. So we're not going to use Me that. Too. So next time I see you, we'll probably be in Nepal. So you, you, can, you can stand me some cake in one of the bakeries in Namchi. So we'll, 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 I'll meet you halfway on that. Fair enough, fair enough. It's one of my favorite places for cake. So it, it was, what, 2016 that you really burst onto the international scene by becoming the first, and, and I'm going to say this, the first American uh, lady female to climb Everest. Now, I know on your bio it says the first to climb and descend, but I'm going to say this, not you. I think in a sense is up and down. You've got to get down. So I'm going to say the first American to climb Everest. It was your second attempt, was it not? Yeah, I mean, to climb without supplemental oxygen, I had really tried, like properly tried, um, 
two other times. So it was my third, my third try at it. You know, it was my sixth climb on Everest. Um, and the previous other climbs I was guiding and just sort of gaining that experience about my own self at altitude and how I did and, and what it would actually take to make this work. Um, but yeah, I'd tried two previous times and I had not been successful for a couple of different reasons. And uh, it was in my mind, my last attempt. And I was really committed to the purpose of the um, of attempting to do that was to just explore what was possible for myself not to prove something, not to say, oh, I can do this, not to have this accolade, but to just answer this question of, can somebody as like average as me put in the work and put in the experience time to get to know myself well enough and know altitude well enough that I could do this. And I was gonna be perfectly fine, no matter what the answer was, if I wasn't successful, but I actually got a good chance to give it a go, then I was gonna be fine not trying to do this again. Cause it is like a very, a physiologically brutal thing to do to your body. You know, it's a, a really like deplete yourself of, of everything. And I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to try this 10 times without succeeding. I mean, there are climbers who have tried it many times without succeeding and just keep going back. But I just knew that if I couldn't do it, I was going to be okay with that answer. And, um, but I really wanted to try, you know, I wanted to give it one, one final good go. So there's a couple of things in there. I, I love the fact you just got a car go past you. That's so cool. Yeah. So but, 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 but we should say to the viewers, so, so you live about four hours from Seattle and you've had to drive yep. to get connection to speak to us today. I yeah. love that. You're so yeah. dedicated. I apologize. I, I apologize if the connection's not good, but you have to realize I'm like nestled in the middle of the mountains right now in a tiny little town. There's about 300 people that live in my town and we don't have good enough internet at our house to connect to Zoom. And so I'm sitting at the end of the road on a salting. <laughs> Okay, everything you do is so badass. It's unbelievable. Now, I, I'm going to stick with the Everest thing for a while because, because I, I am deeply interested in this for obvious reasons. And you said that you, you said that you needed to know. And there hardly a day goes by without without me thinking at some stage that I also need to know. I, I need to know what my limits are. Um, and I, I didn't realize that you had tried three times without O's. I, I knew you got high on Makalu with our mutual friend, uh, Dave Morton. And you turned yeah. around on that day. You were on a summit ridge, were you not? And you turned around because you were, was, was it because you were cold? Uh, you know, I was really, that trip taught me more about myself at very high altitude without oxygen than any other trip that I had done up to that point, um, which I hadn't done a ton at that point. I'd been going to Nepal every year since 2008, twice a year and climbing and guiding and getting experience. But that was 2011. And um, yeah, I, I turned around because I couldn't keep up with Dave. <laughs> like any amount of badassery that I have is just completely muted by all of the people I hang out with who are just so much better. And um, Dave was just faster and I couldn't keep warm. And so we made a really, in my opinion, crazy decision to split up on summit day and he continued on and I went to camp and uh, like, I just don't know if I would do it again. It's still, I feel like, you know, we still need to have like a glass of whiskey and hash that out a little bit. Cause it's such a crazy, that was such a crazy moment for me and really defined a ton of what my ethic for being up high would be in the years to come. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really interesting because if I look back to an early 8,000 meter peak decision for myself. This is on Everest in what, 2006. Um, we, we had a super late summit with clients. We didn't summit to a half past three in the afternoon. And that was my decision. And people often say to me, well, yeah. if you were in that position again, would you do the same thing? And it's impossible. I think it's almost impossible to make that decision again because you have to be there. You know, and things, yeah. things are never quite the same. So it's almost irrelevant to go back and mm -hmm. you, you can learn from it, but you can't make, you know, you, yeah. you can't say to somebody, okay, I would have done it differently or I would have done it the same because it is, you know, that, that time has passed and we move on. And what you did, you learned from that. So Makalu is what, the fifth highest mountain? Um, and you learned yeah. from that. And then you took it to Everest and your first O2 list ascent on Everest was when? 14? The first attempt. Um, so the first real attempt was actually before that Makalu trip. It was oh, in wow. 2010. 
with Dave. And um, yeah, we ended up, it was the same situation really. And it was a totally uh, heartbreaking moment for me because we had done all the work, done all the acclimatization, got up high, got up to, you know, camp four at 8,000 meters without oxygen. And we just had this very real talk that was like, you know, him telling me that he didn't think I was going to be fast enough to have enough hours in the day to do it. And you know, I trusted him so much. He was my mentor. I do trust him. I, I so believe that he was right in that moment that I needed to still figure some things out. You know, I needed to figure out um, a lot about myself and altitude and just my training and my ability to suffer and my ability to push faster. And so I, um, I made this decision to put on the oxygen mask at the camp four. And, you know, it's crazy to think that you spend 50 days I mean, you spend a year at least working towards something, training for it. And then you spend 50 days actually like moving inch by inch towards this really big goal. And in one second, you put that mask on your face and your goal is gone, you know, and it was a real grieving moment for me, which sounds like self-indulgent and um, just whatever, but it was, it was like all this the work every day that I had suffered previously felt like, ugh. For what? And the answer for what is experience, right? And you're so right. The idea that you, you know, every time I hear about an Everest season and um, a thing that has gone on on Everest or any high mountains, and people are sort of pontificating and asking for experts' opinions, and people want to know, what do you think of this thing on Everest? And I feel the same way. It's like, unless you're there in that moment with all of those circumstances and all of those emotions and all of those um, characters, you can't know, you can't know what it's like. It's like uh, decisions are um, amplified, consequences are amplified. And, um, you know, we just do the best we can and try to try to take those things and learn from them. So yeah, it's a crazy journey. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I th we've both been the victim of this to a certain extent, the armchair or the keyboard yeah. warrior. Um, who will perhaps lambast us over social media, or I've got some quite nasty emails uh, in the past about some of the things that yep. I've done. And it, 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 I think you're absolutely right. It's impossible to cast judgment and, unless you are actually there. And even if we take Everest out the equation, which is this almost unique melting pot of, you know, there's politics there, there's ego there, there's ambition there, there's money. Even on a, a smaller, lesser known mountain, Makalu, for instance, or yeah. uh, you know, anything, you know, Burundi, which I know that you've been on in the past, you know, these lesser known mountains, the, the decision-making processes are still the same. They're still driven to a certain extent by the weather, the conditions, uh, you know, how the team is doing, how you're feeling on a particular day, what the general psyche is. You know, these are the things which ultimately push you in a certain direction. And it's easy to be sat at home and to say, oh, well, Melissa made a bad mistake or Kenton shouldn't have done that. And it's, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. It's, it's something which goes in, our, in the territory, I think. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because that exact thing, which is a funny balance for both of us, like we, we benefit from spectators caring about the, you know, really pointless uphill walking that we do. Like we, we benefit, we've made a career out of it. It's like, we we're so clever in that way. Like we just walk uphill slowly <laughs> and repetitively. Very slowly, in my case. Yeah, super slow, and me too. Um, but people care and that's because the mountains draw our attention to something wild that just doesn't exist in the same places in the world in the same ways that it did in like the great era of exploration in the twenties and the fifties. Um, but we're also really exposed to people's critique and people's, um, you know, um, the, the protection that I say is like their uneducated critique. Like if somebody doesn't understand the situation, I don't necessarily need their feedback on what I'm doing. But the truth is you don't forget it. You remember it, it sort of stings and you want them to understand. And so in 2016, when I decided to try to climb Everest again, without supplemental oxygen, you know, I just come through two really tragic seasons. 2014 was the icefall avalanche that killed 16 local workers. And then 2015, I was there and the um, earthquake happened in Nepal. And I just was feeling really, um, 
just sensitive and vulnerable. And so I actually decided to not tell anybody that I was planning to climb without supplemental oxygen, including my sponsors, um, my family, <laughs> uh, my uh, friends, any of the media. I got asked a lot, are you going to go back? Are you going to try? And I just said, no, I'm, I'm actually guiding. I'm working with one of my um, mentorship clients this spring in Nepal, which was true. I was doing that. But then as soon as I was done, I left and I flew to Tibet and I went to the North side, which I had never been to. And I went with my boyfriend at the time, who's my husband now. And, um, you know, he's a mountain guide, but had never been on Everest. We had, neither of us had ever been to the North side and we showed up. And of course, as soon as we showed up, it was like, everybody knew we were there. So I had to do a little bit of, um, damage control. And I like sent the sponsors an email and said like, Hey, I just want to go under the radar. We're not going to have internet. We're not going to do anything this whole season. I'll let you know how things go. And I didn't, you know, we had really limited connectivity. I think I connected to uh, the satellite modem like twice the whole season. And we, um, we shared a camp, a high camp um, base camp tent with another team. And we otherwise were just on our own. We didn't have any staff working with us, helping carry loads. It was just the two of us. And, you know, we got our asses handed properly to us, carrying all that weight up high to get his oxygen up high so that he could support me properly. And um, I went through the whole roller coaster of, uh, is this going to happen? Good days and bad days. You know, an expedition is long enough that you have some really bad days where you just start think like, oh, I can't do this. And then you have some really great days where you're like, gosh, this is this is working out. And it was so important to me to insulate myself from the good and the bad um, feedback from the public. I didn't want to be buoyed by the accolades of people telling me how amazing I was and fall into some trap where I, I felt I was so amazing that I was suddenly like immune from the high risks of the high mountains, which can happen. You know, you can start to believe the hype about yourself. You're like, I am amazing. I can do this. I really wanted to just confront the reality in front of me and see what that was. And I didn't want the negative feedback either, you know, and ultimately I was successful. And on May 23rd, I summited and um, without the use of supplemental oxygen and then descended, which was much harder than climbing up for sure. Cause your hours without oxygen are just ticking up and everything gets harder and harder. And um, yeah, it just, I felt so good for myself about the decision to do it out of the public eye. Of course, immediately was in the public eye and I, you know, have enjoyed all of the congratulations. Cause honestly, it's one of the few things in my life that I think deserves congratulations. Like I'll, I'll receive the congrats because I worked very, very hard to do it. And it was very, very hard. And it took tremendous um, persistence and perseverance to get there and, and a lot of work and a lot of um, suffering and sacrifice. And so no, I feel like I earned that, but I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't have it during the time. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a lot of learning. So first of all, I've got to say, we all knew what you were doing. As, as, soon as, we, as soon as I heard that you were on the north side, and I hang on, yeah. she, she's not going to let this lie. Um, so <laughs> it got kind of within the circle, we kind of knew yeah. what was going on up there. I think maybe Dave had perhaps uh, let me into a little yeah. secret. But, but, but you were saying about this congratulations, because I, I'm going to move on from Everest, but otherwise my, I'm just going to wake up tomorrow morning and say to my wife, that's it, I'm doing Everest with Zero 02. Um, sorry, and, sorry, Ken's wife. And, and the, the picture of you on the top, I think is one of my favorite summit photos. You look so happy and so at ease, which I think is a reflection on the time and energy that you put in to gain the experience to be there. I love that photograph of you on the top. So yeah, I, I've not seen you since you did it. Bloody well done, super impressed. But I think whether congratulations should go arguably even more, and we can take a step back, it involves Dave Morton. Mm -hmm. I first heard about this in, sure. think, in 2015. We, Dave and I were in India together, trying a new route on Nanda Devi East. And in the, well, we had to leave very quickly from base camp because my father was busy dying and Dave was this amazing um, person I could lean on physically and emotionally to try to get me through that as we rushed back to Delhi uh, together. And I think it was at that point he first mentioned the Juniper Foundation. Now the Juniper Foundation, for those who don't know, and jump in if I'm getting this wrong, you essentially help support the families of Sherpas, both male and female, who have lost their lives at work in the mountains in Nepal. And my understanding is, and mm -hmm. it sounds quite raw, 
but I love it for this. You essentially will knock on the door with a big stack of cash and say, hey, this is going to help you in the short to medium term to get through the situation you find yourself in. Am, am I right in thinking pretty much that's how the, the, the foundation yeah, you know, works? It is. It is. We just recognized that there was a need through both of our experiences of loss with local workers in Nepal. And we recognized that families needed a sort of non-discretionary cash temporarily. And so we created a grant that provides five years of financial support to a family after a death. And it can make up for an income. In some cases, it can pay more than the income would have been. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't meet what the income was, but it's something. And then we also realized pretty quickly that we wanted to do more. It needed to be like a more comprehensive program. So we started offering um, small business grants and vocational training access for the families so that in that five years where we were supporting them financially in some way, they could gain a trade and they could maybe own their own business. And we have a number of families who have, specifically women, because it's a lot of widows and mothers that we end up supporting um, whose sons have died or whose husbands have died. And we have a number of women who, um, you know, are uh, born into village life, had limited access to education, and now they're running their very own business, whether that's a tea house or they have yaks that they've purchased and they're using them for herding and carrying loads and milk. Um, or a chicken farm. We have a family in um, south of Kathmandu that has a big chicken farm and provides eggs and chicken meat and things. And it's just the most incredible thing to see people. It's horrendous to see people in the moment of grief. I have been exposed to it so much and it never is easy. It's never once been like, okay, well, I'm used to this because it's so visceral. It's so raw and there's nothing that replaces the loss of a person as we know you know, it's just a permanent hole. And so seeing them be able to reimagine their lives after that five years, and then we just keep in contact with them forever. And we provide just access to language classes or, you know, we just, we just pester them. We really do. We're like, Hey, what are you doing? How's it going? Um, and how are your kids? How are your grandkids? Um, how's that little house? Did you guys fix that hole in the wall that was there? Like you were going to fix the hole. And, um, so it's just lovely. You know, it's been a really, it's been the most enriching part of my life. It was not a intentional thing. I mean, Dave and I, we joke, we say like, if you want to tank a nonprofit, like have two mountain guides run it. And so somehow <laughs> through the generosity of donors who have helped support our programs, we have been able to not tank it. And we also like ensnared some people much smarter than us, which is, you know, the key to everything in life is having people who are better than you around. And so, yeah, we have a Nepal operations manager and she is just the lifeblood of our organization. She makes constant contact with the families, including now while they're all on lockdown and um, in a really tender time in the country that's not prepared for a major virus outbreak at all. They have no medical infrastructure to support that. And so, you know, we're just trying to do what we can. And we both, we all have received so much from the country and the people in the country. And I don't really view it as giving back. I view it as like fulfilling an obligation that we have, you know, our privilege of um, being born where we are and, and the privilege that we've just been afforded in life is it feels right to just share in that privilege and, and take anything that we get and just share that as well. Well, I mean, I, I'm completely blown away. I mean, as you know, I, I've known Dave for about 20 years now. Our careers have done this. I first met him on Amadablam in 2000 or 2001. And we're both guiding in the Himalayas pretty much for the first time. And then you know, he was working for, uh, I think it was AAI or I forget who Dave used to work for. And I was, anyway. Um, and, and I've got to thank both of you because my Everest Camp 2 cook died in the, in the earthquake and the blast in 2015. And I know yeah. you guys are helping Pasan Temba's family out. So you know, just a little bit of me will always be grateful for that. Pasan Temba was this amazing, amazing man. He's all deaf. Uh, used to be like, oh, oh, oh. He used to speak in his really high-pitched voice with some beautiful daughters, these big ears and about beautiful daughters. And you guys are just helping the family so much. It's, it's so, so amazing to see. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great. And you were talking about the donors. I mean, I, I, I keep an eye on the Juniper um, Fund, Juniper Foundation, and see. And you have infiltrated pretty much the great and the good of American climbing. 
It's amazing. No yeah, stone, right. stone is unturned. You guys have been so hard at work. I mean, how does that work? I mean, how yeah. do you reach out to them? How do you, you know, how do you connect with these yeah. people? Well, you know, the amazing thing is that um, I hate asking people for money. I really do. I think it's like one of the worst things to do. I'm not good at begging. I would rather just like, go do hard work. Um, but I really am much worse at sitting in front of a family who's telling me what they need and telling them I can't, I have no way to do that. So I sort of like center myself and Dave and I center ourselves a lot on um, what the, what we're doing, you know, who we're serving and, and just get over ourselves a little bit. And then we've been able to do some really cool, like climbing fundraisers where people join us on a climb and that supports so many of our programs. And then right now, like I should be in Nepal right now and working on a bunch of film work that helps to bring to life some of those stories like Pasang Kemba, you know, and we want, we don't want people who have had never had an experience with the Sherpa people or the people in Nepal to just think of the Sherpa as one homogenous person. We want to bring these stories to people so that somebody who's watching can see Pasang Temba's daughters and feel the same light that you feel and understand that these people are all such individuals and they provided such an incredible element of their communities and their families and they're incredibly missed. They're not just workers in a cog that are unnoticed. They're not anonymous at all. And we want to just share some of those stories. And I think that you know, if we all just anybody who's ever climbed um, in Asia, in Nepal, you know, we've used porters, we've used high altitude workers to support our expeditions and our success. And um, anybody who has spectated us climbing from their armchair, and if they have an opinion that's good or bad, those people are also using the high altitude workers, you know, they're using that infrastructure to have something to watch. And so it's like, it doesn't matter if you're ever going to go to Nepal and work with high altitude workers, you should support them. Like you should support their families after tragedy happens. And hopefully we can work with other orgs that help to mitigate tragedies happening. You know, like that's not our role exactly, but there are great organizations that help training and first aid and other access to things that can mitigate um, some of these accidents happening. But, you know, mountains are dangerous. And like, even in the best case scenario, accidents are going to still happen. And so we just want to provide a safety net that doesn't currently exist. No, I mean, I think the work you do is stunning. And, you know, in the case of Passan Temba, my relationship with Passan Temba started my first year on Everest, 2004. And I didn't know him then. We were on different teams. He was doing a carry for a different team. And he was on the Lhotse face. And he, he didn't have any sun cream. And I, I gave him some of my sun cream. And it was a simple act such as that. And mm -hmm. about two days later, he came. He found me in, in my camp. And he had five bottles of Coca-Cola to say thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. It's so yeah. general. I mean, these guys, as you know, they, they have so little, yet they are so generous of heart. It's, it's so wonderful to mm -hmm. see people like yourselves. I say it's an, an, an obligation, I think, to, to in, in a certain extent, mm -hmm. uh, to help and to give back and to give a second chance to, to families. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I, 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 said, I said long ago that if I was able to summit Everest without oxygen, I would try to use whatever uh, like attention benefit that I received from that to funnel energy into the organization that would give back to Nepal and support the country in a way that had enabled me to live a dream of mine and pursue curiosity and curiosity and generosity to me are like two of my core life values. And to be able to like bring those together in one of the most sacred places in the world that I know about, which is Mount Everest. And, um, you know, it's just a gift. It really is. It's a, I, I feel humbled that I'm able to do something for people who are so generous and all those bottles of Coke and all those um, kind encouragements and the hot bowls of soup and, you know, just the dirty Nepali jokes that I've learned. I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to those people. And so I want to just do what I can. Now, I noticed on social, I think it was last year, because I, I missed you just in the pool. You were traveling uh, with your daughter, and she was, what, one? She was teeny yeah, tiny. Yeah, one. And, and is that a case that you rock up in some of these villages, and she, she must be treated like a princess? Oh, she is a total celebrity in Nepal. It's actually super funny. So she went with me the first time when she was six months old. Um, we took her there. And um, just to sort of expose her and get it in her DNA early, this, um, this place and these people. And it has been 
long a vision of mine that I would share this part of the world with her and not as a tourist, um, but really like in the fiber of her um, upbringing. And so I want to have her go to school in Nepal for part of the year and just experience life with the other kids and just get to understand some of the privilege that she does have by just, you know, being born as a white girl in America and see the world and how big and different it can be. But um, yeah, so six months old, she came the first time. And the second time she came, like all the, um, even in Kathmandu, the hotel that we stay at, all of the workers are like, oh, it's baby Kaya again. Hi, Kaya. And um, all of the Sherpa. It's so funny because she has like a very strong um, uh, uh, preference is probably the right word for just, I would say in general, Asian people. Like we, we took her to Japan. It was the same. She'll reach out for them. And um, when she was a small baby, but like any just, white American people she's like very reserved with and she doesn't feel comfortable being held by but the Sherpa women especially are so incredible they just pick her up and you know I it was the case that it was the biggest break from parenting I ever had was taking her to Nepal because like somebody was always caring for her. unless I was feeding her she was like gone off with somebody else and um, yeah it's a really fun thing to just get to experience uh, that culture and how they embrace, you know, my daughter and get to share the world with her. So I mean, I can't wait until I can bring her back. Damn, I, 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 I missed that one. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't strong enough to take my children when they were teeny tiny. It's definitely on our radar. Because uh, Dave, I bumped into Dave, Dave Morton again, uh, two years ago, yeah. I think it was. And he'd just been paddle boarding with Thorne, yeah. uh, his son, Crazy. Uh, for about, about, about a week down a river that he'd never paddle boarded on yeah. before. And they had this amazing adventure. I think there's a small film on it. And I bumped into Dave in the Yaki yeah. Yeti Hotel just as they finished. And I think he was flying out that day. He wasn't staying there. And Thorne was hungry. And he said to his dad, oh, dad, you know, get, get, can I get some breakfast? And Dave, ever the, the, the dirt bum climber said, uh, Thorne, just go and help yourself to the buffet dinner, a uh, buffet breakfast. And, you know, obviously Dave's yeah. wife, KK, is from Asia. So Thorne has a slight Asian look to him. And Dave said, oh, if anybody mm -hmm. you know, sort of tries to stop you, just pretend you don't speak English. And I just thought that's such yeah. a life skill to be able to bum a buffet breakfast in the Yak and Yeti Hotel. That's a real life skill right there. And it's fantastic. Yes, it is. The typical day. <laughs> Passing on the important thing. Yeah, well, once yeah, a dirt exactly. bum climber, always a dirt bum climber. And I noticed that you, you, you are in your, in your car, which we spoke briefly yesterday. It's the Toyota, yep. which is one of the sort of yep. iconic climbing dirt bag cars that, that that all american climbers have that's right isn't is it not yeah i mean i have had a toyota for my whole adult life i lived in the back of it when i was just a true dirt bag climbing bum i made no money so i was just crashing in front of friends houses and um, camping on public land and living in the back and just like a little enclosed space and uh, you know i've gotten more civilized now i have a house but i can't get rid of the truck <laughs> you can't get rid of the truck so i'm just going to take you back a little bit in time uh, so when i first met you you yeah. were already like crushing it in the high himalayas but just just tell the viewers yeah, and the that. listeners you were crushing it you've always crushed it just tell the viewers a little <laughs> bit about how like a young melissa so I, I was reading up on you so i've got an idea but how did you morph from the little girl that you were to this badass, proper Himalayan legend that you are now. What, what, was, the, the, what was the journey that mm -hmm. took you on it? Yeah, you know, so I didn't start climbing at all um, until I was 19 years old. And I had always been very athletic, but not competitive. So organized sports didn't appeal to me. I didn't have an outlet for that athleticism. And fresh morning, and I, I just got to the summit of this little peak, and I looked out, and I just saw all of the other peaks, and I was like, okay, if I get the skill set, it's a, it becomes a language that's universal, and I can take it all over the earth. And I had a curiosity and a desire to travel, but I didn't have the economic means to do that. I didn't have a trade that was going to allow me to travel, and so I started getting into climbing, and every single thing I did that I got, did a little bit more climbing, I learned another skill and it opened up a whole other world to me. 
And I just kept pushing towards it. And it was something where it's hard to explain. Um, but the best way I can explain it is that, you know, when you get on a bike for the first time and you pedal that bike, you don't know how to ride a bike. But when you're doing it right, you know you're doing it right. It's a feeling inside your core. You're in balance. You're moving forward. And that's what climbing mountains was for me. I just immediately had that feeling of like, this is life and I'm doing it right. And this is the path I'm meant to be on. And I have this amazing um, classroom really, and this endless exploration in the world. It doesn't matter what I've done in the past, no mountains care, which mountains I've previously climbed. You know, I climb Rainier every summer, I guide there, I've climbed the peak hundreds of times, and every time it's still a challenge. And there's routes that are way too hard for me to climb on that mountain. And so that's my home mountain, you know, that's just like within a stone's throw from my home. And, and there's other mountains that are closer and lesser known. And I just, the opportunity to have a thing that can't be perfected, you know, cause it's nature, it's working with nature is so appealing to me. So that for me, was like my path. I kept climbing. I was just dirt bag glommed onto friends. I'd buy the beer or I'd flake out the ropes in exchange for somebody leading and showing me showing me the ropes literally. And then I started guiding on Mount Rainier in 2004 and, um, and that changed my life. You know, in the next year I started guiding internationally and then I had the opportunity to go to Nepal with Dave, um, uh, as an assistant guide on Mount Everest in 2008, just four years after I started guiding. And I just was a little sponge and I still am in so many ways, you know, like I want to soak up all the knowledge that everybody who came before me and everybody that's doing things now um, is doing because there's just it's such an incredible community. Wow! Yeah, I, I think you put that so eloquently. Um, that, that's one of the it's it beautifully put. I, mean, I just just listening to you there, I've, I've got to say, for somebody that's got such an amazing track record, I I'm always every time I meet you, I'm I'm always left by thinking how humble you are for somebody that is so, and I keep using this term because it's an American term that I love, you are so badass. I mean, to climb Everest without oxygen, I find a huge inspiration. But your ego, you're so good at putting your ego to one side. I don't even think you have an ego, which is one of the reasons why I you, I think that's one of the reasons why you've been so successful at what you do, because you are, you are doing it for the right reasons. And we don't see that that often, I think, in this day and age in our sport. Yeah, you know, I actually think that like the boldest thing that I have done um, in my life is to feel that flicker of passion and know that the path ahead of me is so hard and I'm going to have to suffer and I'm going to have to be challenged. And I'm, it has no success, it has no end. And to go in any way, you know, and young people and especially people, young women, especially, but people who are interested in getting into the mountains, they always say like, how do you get started? And the truth is there's no, I don't have an answer for that because each individual brings something to the table that's different and your, and your resources are going to be different. But the number one thing you have to have is passion. And I think to follow a passion is the very boldest thing you can do it's not sexy. You know, it's often really not sexy. It's really hard and it's full of toil and it's, it, it takes so long to receive um, accolades from following a passion. And the beautiful part about it being a passion is that it doesn't matter. And so I do have an ego. I'm driven to succeed. I love it when people acknowledge my accomplishments, you know, all of that is true. But what is more true is that I'm fundamentally pursuing a life that is in line with my values and in line with my passions and that trumps my ego that's bigger than my ego and it's um it's what's grounding it really grounds you because i just know i'm not doing this to be famous i'm doing this because it is it's the love of my soul you know my soul is content and that is it offers a really nice easefulness in my life yeah and i gotta say i i, I truly believe that you know you have one of the most beautiful souls out of any of the mountain guides out there because mountain guides we have egos like this where we're, we're, we're renowned we for do, it. all those jokes about the difference between yeah. god and a mountain guide you know god clearly doesn't think he's a mountain Very guide etc 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 but but you, you know your soul is 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 truly beautiful now i'm really conscious that you've got to drive back home at some stage for your daughter yeah. but there's a couple of things there's, there's a couple of very quick things i want to touch upon one is I've got to ask you know what is next uh, uh, you know am I going to be seeing you in the big hills again or is that being put on 
you know, have you parked that for a little bit now? What's, what, what's the plan moving forward for the next, next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I think you know so much that there's no such thing as like um, a retired high altitude mountaineer. We're just like in remission in a way. Um, and so, you know, the big mountains are a huge draw for me. I'm guiding uh, full time when I can again. You know, our businesses are just suspended right now and it's a crazy time for everybody, of course. But, um, you know, I'm still guiding in the big mountains. I've been doing a lot of mentorship work with sort of young and, and, and older folks who have an interest in developing um, mountain professions and doing kind of one-on-one -on -one training and work to get them the leadership skills and the experience to be in the big mountains. And, you know, I, I don't, I can't say that I'm finished with, I, I can, what I can say is I'm not going to climb Everest without oxygen again, because I killed a bunch of brain cells doing that. But the ones I didn't kill are the ones that reminded me how painful it is. And I'm done. I'm good. I'm not going back to do that. But Will I go back to Everest? I mean, it's like such a core landmark in my life. And I I just, I can't imagine not returning in some way. And I don't know how that looks exactly. It has to be really the right circumstances as it always has been the right circumstances. So, you know, we'll see. I think right now I, I'm just sort of presenting myself with like immediately what's in front of me. And if something stirs that spark of passion, then I'll say yes. You know, I'm really interested in saying yes to adventure. No, I, I love that. You're keeping it really fluid, which I think is, that's what mountains teach us. You know, they, they teach us that yeah. we've got to be fluid with our decisions. We've got to be fluid with our plans because the mountains don't care who we are, like you said earlier. It's, Not at all. They, they are these immovable beasts and, and we've got to find a way to work with them rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, 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 I think that's amazing. And, and that, that's, that's the other thing. I'm, I'm just going to touch upon it very, very quickly because you've got to get back. Um, you were saying about the mentorship. You were mentoring a young girl that absolutely, and you did most of it yourself as well, absolutely crushed what you called the 50 peak challenge, the 50 highest points in the 50 yeah. states in the US. Now, yeah. just very briefly, that to me looked like like climbing 15 Everest's back to back. That looked proper yeah. endurance hardcore. Yeah, you know, what was crazy was we started that expedition right after I climbed Everest without oxygen. So I had you like must three have been weeks crushed. to recover. Yeah, I was crushed. I really was crushed. So I did not join her on Denali, which was the first peak. Um, I had a frostbite injury from Everest that I was trying to let recover. And so I met her in Florida and right after she had summited Denali and we began the journey and um, it was so hard. And I, I can't really tell people this because I get a lot of disbelief, but it was harder than climbing Everest without oxygen in many, many ways. I mean, I day over day, we barely slept. I was driving half the time as well. So I was driving and then climbing all these peaks. We hundreds and hundreds of miles of walking, hiking, the logistics of trying to figure out which state to go to next. Like you think it would be simple, but it's really complicated where to go, when to get there. We had like our van broke down. We had wildfires that turned us around. We had permit issues with getting onto some of the land. And every minute that we weren't doing something, we were like losing time because we wanted to try to beat the speed record, which was like 44 days or something mm -hmm. at that point. And so we had this really like uh, attention that we had put on ourselves and it just ended up being the most beautiful journey. And this was an idea of hers, you know, that she had had years before when we were on the summit of the high point in Idaho together. And she said, Oh, you know, could we climb all the high points? And I said, I definitely wouldn't do that unless we did it like super fast. And so she started putting together that project and, um, it was the most amazing thing. She was 22 or something when we did that. And wow. I just watched her grow up. I watched her become a full adult on the process and we had challenges and we overcame conflict together as a team. And it just taught me so much. I mean, I left that trip having learned more than I've learned on almost any other experience. And like, I just, you know, I so deeply want to write a book about all the experiences because every day was like packed to the brim with challenge, experience, and joy. And there's just so few times in our life that we get that much of like the feelings of life all condensed into one, one two month period. So are, are we going to see a book anytime soon? I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it would be epic. I mean, I, 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 yeah. I can see it now. I mean, you got, you got so much material, so much learning that you could put in 
uh, and, you know, you could help so many people that way. I think it'd be a fantastic, perhaps you could, you know, like so many people, are, they're writing books during lockdown. Um, yeah. So, um, listen, I've I, I got to thank you. I, I'm very conscious of your time, Melissa. Uh, you've got a two-year-old you've got to get back to. Um, yeah. I, I don't even know how to begin to wrap this up, but I've got to bring it home at some stage. So I just want to say thank you uh, for, for finding the time so early in the morning uh, to come out, for having such a great connection, and I suppose for being a great friend. Uh, I draw inspiration yeah. from you. Um, and I'm sure all the viewers and your contemporaries and you know, the people that you mentor, they're so lucky to have you. We're so lucky to have you in the community. So from here in the UK, in our own lockdown, in our own confinement, I want to say a massive thank you, Melissa. Start the engine, get home, look after the little girl, and I can't wait to see you over in the port. Oh, come and visit us. Come, come rock climbing in the UK. Yeah. Bring the family. Here we go. Invitation for me to you. Bring the whole family. Bring Tyler. We go rock climbing. We'll drink beer. We we'll drink coffee and we we'll have good That's times. Great. Yeah. Well, Ken, before I go, I have to tell you that um, you have played a huge part in any successes that I've had. And I think there's an often under-recognized um, kindness among peers that, you know, like we say, our egos really get in the way of that sometimes. And when I was just a little baby mountaineer, just trying to grow into being an adult mountaineer, you were so kind and so generous with your experience. And I have always looked up to you and I continue to look up to you. And so it has been just a wonderful joy to get to connect with you like this. And, um, you know, I hope to share a rope with you soon. Right. Thanks, thanks right. Melissa. And just one final thing. Uh, if people want to hit you up for uh, the Juniper uh, Fund, they, they, uh, yep. they, it's, it's just they can just Google Juniper, Juniper, uh, Juniper Farm, yeah. and then they can find yeah, you can just, Yep, they can look at my website too. It's just melissaarnot.com, and um, there's links to the Juniper Fund, to uh, my guiding, all of that stuff, if anybody wants additional Fantastic. Info. Right, you get home, refill the coffee, okay, thank you. and I'll see you very shortly. Thanks, Melissa. You take care. Big love. Bye. Wow. Wow. That conversation with Melissa has blown my mind. Uh, where, where, where do you start with that career? It's absolutely phenomenal. And I think the thing that really got me is, is how quick she rose from those first little steps into the mountains right through to being on Everest you know, just four or five years after she started Gaiden. And I, I think that's down to her immense determination, but above all, the passion that she has for the mountains. It's uh, absolutely unbelievable. I really hope that you dig that as much as I enjoyed it. Um, hit us up. Uh, let me know. Let Melissa know what you thought of it uh, on any of her social media channels. Now, let's not forget why we are doing this for I hope that you are enjoying the cool conversations, but we are doing it, it's all free of charge, but we are doing it to try to save our barn, the barn theatre where we're broadcasting from today. Now you can text as well as donate through their website. So to text, you literally write save our barn, followed by an amount, and you text that to 70085. So for example, you write save our barn 10, that will donate £10 to this fantastic cause. Now remember that 70085, save our barn, followed by amount. 10, 100, 1,000, whatever you can afford, that will make a huge difference. Or of course, click on any of these links uh, and you can donate through the uh, normal, cause, uh, normal um, channels. So that's the end of Cool Conversations number five, believe it or not. Now, we're getting organized. I know it's hard to believe, but we are getting organized. We've already got next week's guest. Can you believe that? So that's a first for us. And next week's guest, she's a double Olympic champion, a nine times world champion, a very good friend buddy of mine, is none other than the Olympic cyclist Victoria Pendleton, or as I know her, VP. So check us out next week. It's the same place. It's the same time. Next week, cool conversations with the lovely VP. Thanks for viewing, guys. And remember, text, save our barn, 
followed by the amount 70085. Please be generous for this fantastic cause. we we'll see you next week. Oh yeah, uh, where? Can we do anything with a screen to make me have bigger muscles like abs? Oh, there he is. Listen, I gotta tell you, I watched it for the first time this morning, your Everest program. Yeah, yeah oh, did you? Now, I, I've not seen it before, because I kind of know how it ends. Um, so I just thought, yeah, well, what's the point? I, I enjoyed oh, it, and it brought back some strong memories. Yeah. Uh, I love the fact Good. you edited me out, but that, hey, that's okay. Yeah. Chat to the team. Yep. Uh, what, 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 we, what are we doing, boys? <laughs> I knew that was coming. No, ladies, I'm not getting naked. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> I've taken myself outside for a bit of a walk with a dog in the rain and the cold. I mean, I, 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 I mean, personally, I mean, I don't, I, I don't give a shit. But. Hey, Dave. In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working you UN, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, 
Our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.